Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Joseph Glor, your host and the assistant content director here at Word on Fire. And with us, as always, is our favorite Bible-bearing Santa Barbarian, Bishop Robert Barron. <laughs> I'm going to have a new one for you every week. Very good. I like it. Uh, it's good to have you here. Good to be with you, Bishop. Thanks. Great to be with you, Joe. So just recently, you and I were both at the uh, 2017 Religious Education Congress in Anaheim. We recorded a Word on Fire show episode there, actually. It was a lot of fun. I had a great time. I know you did as well. Tell us a little bit about your experience this year at the Congress. Yeah, as always, it was uh, enjoyable. I've been going on and off for the past 20 years. I started going in 1997. And the Congress is is the biggest event of its kind in the country. So about, I think this year they estimated 45,000 people were there at different times. So it's a kind of, you know, James Joycey and here comes everybody experience. You know, you get the whole church is there, left, center, right. Uh, people you agree with, people you don't agree with uh, necessarily. A um, lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. I had a chance to speak in the arena, which is always kind of fun. It's about, I don't know, seven or 8,000 people in there. So I always get a, an uplift from the, uh, from the Congress, and you, you tend to run into everyone you've ever known in the Catholic Church at the Congress. True. Yeah, everybody's so, there. So uh, I get a kick out of it. You also gave a talk when you were there. What, what was that about? What were you focusing on? Well, it was the problem of the nuns, uh, not the N-U-N-S, but the N-O-N-E-S, the rising number of those in our country who say they have no religion. And I have said now many times, and I said it publicly in this big arena, in my judgment, it's problem number one in the Catholic Church is that uh, we're losing our own people, especially our young people. Because if you look at those 30 and younger in our country, we're now up to 40% of that age group says they have no religion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Among Catholics in that same age group, the millennials basically, it's 50%. So I told the people, think of, um, if you're old enough, think of, of all the kids you've seen baptized over the past 30 years, every kid you've seen confirmed mm. over the past 30 years. Half of those kids are no longer with the church. So that's a massive problem, and uh, it's a failure, and to state it bluntly, uh, at all levels of the church. And I, I blame bishops, I blame priests, I blame everybody in a way. But I said in the front lines of this struggle are the, the catechists and teachers and evangelists and apologists, and that we all got to pick up our game a little bit and get our kids uh, our back. So that was my talk. Well, for today's episode, I wanted to kind of continue in, along those same pastoral lines of you kind of helping, encouraging people. We're in the season of Lent right now, and it's a time where people are working out their salvation with fear and trembling, as the scriptures teach us. It's all headed toward the great and certain joy of Easter. And that's precisely what I want to talk to you about today, Bishop, I, I, the hope that's on offer in Christianity. We'll talk about what this Christian hope is and how it's unique from any other faith or worldview. So let's begin by having you define the term hope, because I think there's a difference between the classical definition and our modern sense of hope. Yeah, well, hope is a theological virtue. So we talk about the cardinal virtues, the natural virtues that Aristotle knew about, like courage and prudence and justice, etc. But the theological virtues that Paul names, namely faith, hope, and love, they're called theological because they're not virtues that we can work on so much. We don't uh, habituate ourselves to them in the normal way. You don't practice them the way you practice courage or temperance and so on. They're rather the gifts. They're gifts that come from revelation. Faith is now this ordering of one's life uh, to God, that you've, you've kicked open a door to a transcendent experience, or better, that door is open to you, you know, faith. Um, love is, is the life of God. To will the good of the other as other is the very life of God, which is why Aristotle would talk about magnanimity, maybe, or generosity, but not love in the biblical sense. That's not something available to the philosophers. It's available to those who are standing in Revelation. So hope now is a theological virtue. It's not optimism. Optimism is a worldly attitude. Nothing wrong with it in itself. And, hey, I'm an optimistic person, or I'm optimistic about this uh, project. Fine. Fine, but that's not hope. Hope is a gift. It's the, it's the ordering of one's life now in the ultimate sense toward God. It's the, it's the trajectory toward final salvation. So hope is an ordering toward the overcoming of sin in that final sense, that I aspire to real union with God, to a life on high with God. And so to live your life in hope is not to be a kind of naive optimist, like, oh, it's all going to work out. I mean, someone in Auschwitz could have hope, but not the least bit of optimism. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hope is, an, is a trajectory toward one's ultimate fulfillment through the gift of God, life on high with God. 
Now, once you get that, your whole life here below will indeed change. So it has an implication for this life for sure. He's a person of hope. She has hope, and that means she lives her life very differently. Um, but you have to always keep the, the three of those, faith, hope, and love, within a properly theological or graced context. We talk about hope, and I, I mean, today, you know, you say, oh, gosh, I hope this restaurant has gluten-free options versus like, yeah, I'm right. going to place my hope in gluten-free options, right? Yeah. So the, talk about the difference between those kinds of juxtapositions, yeah, those I, use of the term. Well, because first of all, they'd be just worldly things, you know, so I, I hope this thing happens tomorrow. I hope, you know, I get the job I've been, I've been trying to get. And again, nothing wrong with that, but it's a, this worldly thing. Aquinas says that one hopes, in the strict sense, only for what's difficult, so I don't really say, boy, I hope the sun comes up tomorrow. I don't know. I, I fully expect the sun to come up tomorrow. Right. right. Um, boy, I hope there's air to breathe tomorrow when I wake up. I, no, no, I, I fully expect that. You hope for something which is difficult. Now, put it in the properly theological context. <laughs> What's difficult to the point of impossible for us? Eternal life with God on high. I can't accomplish that. I can't achieve that. That's not the the uh, the goal. The the end result of all kinds of striving on my part. That's a gift. It's a grace, you know? And so I hope that my sins might be forgiven. I hope for eternal life. I hope that God will bring me to heaven. Well, talk about difficult. Yeah, it's impossible. Uh, I I can't do it. But with God, all things are possible. So now I've reordered my life toward this impossible possibility (laughs) that I might be drawn into God's life. And once I have that, it's not a wild hope against hope, it's a grounded hope. So it's grounded, but it's not derivative from my own efforts, if that makes sense. That's all kind of worldly talk. Um, So the saints live vividly out of hope, and and it makes a huge difference in their concrete lives, but they don't see it as the result of their own striving or their own accomplishment. It's difficult to the point of impossible, but with God, all things are possible, even eternal life. There's a lot of things that people put their hope into, right? And in terms of you're saying, well, that that would be my greatest hope is that my sins would be forgiven. Yeah. A lot of people say, my greatest hope is that I, I'll get that that beach house or I'll get that wife or yeah. you know, a lot of people uh, put their their hopes in different things. Talk about what some of those some of those things well, are that are, people are drawn to. Yeah, good. Do a contrast there. So, um, yeah, I don't care about my sins, but I, boy, I hope I get this wife or boy, I hope I get this this house. See, but the trouble is then. <laughs> Having that wife won't do you one bit of good. If you're still sunk in your sins, your marriage is going to turn to dust, right? That house won't do you one bit of good if you're still sunk in your sins. You don't know, you won't know how to use that house properly. The house will destroy you. Oh, if only I had all the riches in the world, but I don't have the forgiveness of my sins, so what? You know. Hmm. So that's the reorientation you might call conversion. But man, is that a concrete thing. So, you know, the famous uh, quartet of wealth, pleasure, power, and honor. Uh, if a genie appeared to you and said, okay, I'll, I'll give you, you know, three wishes. Oh, man, I want to be as rich as Bill Gates. I <laughs> yeah. want to have, you know, I want to have, I want to be as powerful as uh, Donald Trump, and I, I want to be as famous as, uh, you know, Beyonce or something. Okay. Right. Here's the trouble. Here's the trouble. You get all three of those things, but your sins aren't forgiven. They will destroy you. They will all turn on you and destroy you. Right, so when the genie comes here, and they say, "I'll give you three wishes." You know what you wish for, and I don't mean this in some some pious little um, way. You say, "I want faith, hope, and love," because hmm. then, no matter what else you have, you'll know what to do with it. Whether you you have the fame of Beyonce or, or you're nobody, whether you have the power of Donald Trump or you have no power, if you got faith, hope, and love you'll know what to do with those things, and they won't destroy you, you know? So if that genie ever comes, and it would be like some kind of angel, you know? Right. What do you want? That's what you ask for. So well, Thomas Aquinas yeah, on the cross, right? Right. My Episcopal motto, which is derived from, if you want, uh, Thomas's experience like that, the Lord saying, okay, what would you like as a reward? I'm God. I'll give you anything, right? Yeah, you wrote well of me. Yeah, you've written well with me, so hey, time for, boy, I would love to be. No, he said, non nisi te, Domine. I want nothing except you. And see, to say I want you means I want faith, hope, and love. Right. You know, And then, then you know what to do. Then your life will be on an even keel no matter what happens to you. And so that's the right thing to ask for. 
Well, what about my friends who say that they place their hope and love, uh, their hope and, and everything in their family and love and their, their children? I mean, those are good things. I mean, sure. So you, you, your wife and kids. It's, when I talk about God with some of my secular friends, they say, you know, what is your life ultimately about? you got to think about the big picture. And they say, well, you know, it's about me raising my kids. It's about my family and stuff. I mean, I guess your wife, I mean, she could, you know, destroy you as well. <laughs> sure she could. Yeah. No, but sure she could. Yeah. What I mean is not that she's being cruel. I mean, if you don't have faith, hope, and love, that relationship will founder. It will automatically. Um, look at Jesus now in the Gospels in regard to families. You know, hey, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me bury my father. Well, I mean, who'd say no to that? He said no to it. Let the dead bury their dead. Not because he's anti-family, but what he was saying was following me is more important than your family. My family? Mm-hmm. My family's good. Yes, they certainly are. They're terrific. Your father, great man. But following me is more important than, than your father. So even the best things, you might say especially the best things because they can, um, they can mislead us. If we say, my family, and how great it is and how very good it is, but my family's the number one value in my life, more than God, then I got a problem. Now look at the story of Abraham and Isaac again with fresh eyes, right? It's not God playing cruel games. That's the wrong way to read that story. Isaac, your beloved, uh huh. Isaac, the child of promise. You know, Isaac, whom you love, that one, I want you to sacrifice him to me. Mm. This is not God being cruel. It's a very, very vivid way of making this point that finally your hope, Abraham, is not in your son and, and his progeny. It's not in this promise of, of, you know, the, of your line going on. It's in me. It's in me, finally. That's where you put your hope. And once you do that, see, watch the, it's very interesting how that story functions. Once he does that, he gets Isaac back and he gets the progeny back, right? Yeah. But first he had to prove, no, Lord, you're number one in my life. You're the one in whom I put my hope, not my son, even something as wonderful as my son. Right. Now, is that kind of an awful truth? Yeah. Sentimental? Absolutely not. It's, it's really harsh stuff. But it's dead right, you know? Where do you put your hope? Not even in good things. I mean, look, look, wealth, pleasure, power, honor aren't bad in themselves either. Sure. Wealth is not bad in itself. But if you don't have faith, hope, and love, you won't know what to do with your wealth, and it'll turn on you. Uh, power is not a bad thing, but you don't have faith, hope, and love, the power will destroy you, right? Yeah. That, that's the hard edge story of the Bible. And the thing, too, for practical matters, when you're trying to, probably putting that kind of pressure, you're turning a person into God when you do that kind of yeah. thing. And then also, I've, I've heard, too, that anything that you put your hope into that can be taken away from you is going to ultimately set you up for a really yeah. terrible disaster. I mean, if your wife and children, God forbid, look at Job, right? Yeah. What did Juan de la Cruz say, John of the Cross? Is it anything uh, in this life, including life itself, that you take to be ultimate value is an attachment? So he says, get rid of attachments. And Ignatius of Loyola says the same thing, right? What's an attachment? Anything in this world, including your own life, that you're convinced you can't live without. That's an attachment. you got to get rid of it. Right. Now, welcome now to the monastic life and all the disciplines of the spiritual life. These aren't people just being a little you know, kooky and ascetic. They're making this very powerful spiritual point um, that the whole world needs to hear. Now, a monk, let's say, might live it out in a very you know, bold way, unique way. But everyone needs that point, you know. Uh, we all have to deal with our attachments, and that's good for Lenten season that we're in now. Absolutely. Okay, so we get that we should put our hope in God, and then if I continue to put my hope in God, I'm guaranteed to meet and marry a heavenly blessed beauty, pure as the wind driven <laughs> snow, and have babies with her in a beach house. Because I mean, that sounds like it would be pretty awesome. Yeah, right. But that's also your desire. It's what you want. What you've determined. When you hand your life over to Christ, um, you're in for the ride of your life. Meaning. You'll do what he wants. And what he wants is for your good. No question about that. But it's, um, it's going to be surprising what he gives you. So you've got to make that move. So when you say, here's what I want, and those are all good things. You know, the beautiful wife and the kids and family, they're all good things. But is that what you want or what Christ wants for you? And you've got to make that conversion. It's a it's surrender of the ego. And then you'll find real joy, but you've got to be open to what he's going to do, how he will answer your prayer. Um, it's okay to tell Christ what you want. That's okay. Tell him what you want. 
But you know that, that old joke about how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans, right? So right. here's what I want to do, Lord. Well, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but that's the that's the adventure of the spiritual life. So, in a sense, putting your hope in God means that you're actually going to let go of those personal desires, die to yourself, and and all those desires, and then no matter what happens, what God gives you, what path he sets before you, you can still trust that it's ultimately for your best benefit. Yeah, and then you enter into it in the attitude of faith, hope, and love. So that's why the theological virtues are so vital. If you got those in place, it, we'd say you're living a, a, a graced life, you're in the state of grace, you've got those virtues, then you'll know what to do. You'll be able to navigate, you know. Yeah, it reminds me of that that saying that you've preached before about how there's only one great sadness in the world, and that's not yeah. being a saint. Leon Blois said that, right? Yeah, because then at that point, if you're if you're putting your hope in God, and that's the only priority of your life, then everything else that happens to you that could be tragic or whatever, you don't get the wife, or you don't get this desire of your own. Keeping that eternal perspective is not going to weigh much, right? Think of uh, I mentioned John on the cross already, but uh, when he heard a word from the cross, you know, what do you want? He said, I want to be rejected, forgotten, um, uh, marginalized, and, uh, and in suffering. <laughs> he goes, now, what was he saying? What a weird, you know, masochistic guy. No, he was saying the same thing Aquinas said, non nisi te, I want you. So right. the crucified Jesus said, what do you want? I want to be like you. I want to be rejected. Now, translate all that into the language you've been using. I want detachment from the goods of the world that I might be in, in your stance vis-a-vis the Father, that I might do the Father's will. See? So I, I, I want to eschew all these worldly things so that I might be conformed to you in your doing the will of the Father. That's the stance of a saint. And so that's what it really means to put our hope in God. When yeah. What does it mean to put your hope in God? That's, that's it, yeah. right? That's the... Well, it's to live a life of faith, you want to put it that way. I walk by faith, not by sight, meaning it's not me with my eagle eyes looking at things and determining what I want. I walk by faith. I walk, walk by confidence in God. I walk the path of love, so that is the divine life. So at every moment, now I'll do the little flower, at every moment, what's the demand of love? So that means you're living the divine life. So whether I'm rich or poor... Whether I've got what I want or not, what's the demand of love? So, I mean, right now, you and I are sitting here doing this show because we're both convinced this is a path of love. This is willing the good of the other. I hope people listening to the show are benefiting from it and are being drawn closer to God. And so we're, you know, maybe it's not the most heroic love that's ever existed, but it's the demand of the moment. Okay. And I'll walk in hope, meaning my whole life is ordered to its final fulfillment in God. That's what I'm about ultimately. So as I face the day, am I thinking, okay, am I becoming more famous? Am I becoming wealthier? Am I becoming more powerful? People think I'm cooler. Or is the question, am I on my way to heaven or not? <laughs> you know, Am I ordered to the purposes of God or not? Um, what's my focus? See, where my focus? That's where faith, hope, and love come in. Well, if you're just joining us, we're here at the Word on Fire show, and Bishop Barron is talking to us about what hope is, and we're going to get into how it's unique in the Christian life versus uh, any other worldview. So, Bishop, ultimately, what did Jesus do that ensures this Christian hope for us, and, and how is the Christian hope different? Because you've been talking about God so far, so you know, and, and yeah. a lot of religions might say, you put your hope in God. You yeah, know? fair enough, but, but it, this comes from, from Jesus, of course. Think of the uh, scene of the Transfiguration. So they're kind of making their way along and the ups and downs of Jesus' ministry, and he's accepted, not accepted. Um, he's been predicting the cross, etc. But in this one shining moment, the disciples get a, a vision. They get a sense of, wow, who he really is, what he holds out to them. So Aquinas put it that way, that what they needed midway on the journey was a keen sense of the fulfillment of their journey. And that gave them the hope then to endure what was coming their way. So I would say the transfiguration, which is a foreshadowing of the resurrection, the resurrection is that uh, display of hope. It's the display of what's held out to us. And fired by that hope, we face what we have to face in life. You know, So the hope is grounded. It's not just a wild, you know, kind of optimistic thing. It's grounded in the events of, of Jesus, his cross and his resurrection and his transfiguration. Um, so I got confidence to go on, even when it looks like everything's collapsing around me. 
See, you know, go back to um, this attachment, detachment thing. Um, I, I always think of Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order. His whole life's work was all around that. And someone asked him, what would you do if the Pope suppressed the Jesuit order? His answer was, I would need 15 minutes in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and then I'd be fine. You know? <laughs> that's awesome. It's, I haven't heard that. That's yeah. Great. No, and, it's, it's, and, I, and he's, he's right. I believe Ignatius. You know that, okay, I've been given this work to do. I've followed the Lord's will as I've discerned it. This Jesuit order has emerged, and I hope and think for the glory of God. But if it happened that it's all taken away, okay, now, now what do you want me to do? I would tell the students at Mundelein, spiritual life is like, you ride a horse. So God's giving you a horse. Now ride it. Ride it all the way. So I was assigned to St. Paul the Cross Parish in Park Ridge when I was newly ordained. Hop on that horse. Ride it all the way. Right. Until it shot off from under you. All right? So in my case, it was, no, we want you to go off to study in Europe. Okay. Another horse. Gallop on that horse. Till it shot off from under you. And then get the next one, which to me was teaching at, at Mundelein. And then Cardinal George shot that, uh, that horse out from under me, and I got on the horse of this evangelization. And I'm riding it all, word on fire and yeah. all this stuff. And then, boom, that horse is shot <laughs> out, and, and go to California and be an auxiliary bishop. Okay? Uh, you know? It, it, so you're, you're, <laughs> you're living in hope, not making your own plans. All right. You know, uh, here's my horse. Here's where I'm going to ride it. No, do what's given to you to do with all your life and all your enthusiasm, and then eventually it'll get shot off from under you, and then, all right, all right, what's the next horse? Yeah. So Ignatius in front of the Blood Sacrament is like, okay, I did this Jesuit order thing. Uh, I guess that's not going to happen now, so now what do you want? Bring your corpses of the dead horses to the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> it's the lesson of the day. It's yeah. great, though, because I, I, I find that to be so true, and I think that's a great lesson for uh, you know people that really take uh, heart in the Catholic thing because we yeah. have the Blessed Sacrament. We have a place we can go to, and I, I mean, I've used that as well just in, during a time of personal crisis. It's it's amazing. I even tell people the Rosary. You know, yeah. you get done do you do all four mysteries of the Rosary. I don't care what circumstance you're in, you'll come out the other end feeling differently. Yeah. Here's another one with that in mind is uh, my mentor, Cardinal George, who was an OMI, right? Oblate of Mary Immaculate. They were a missionary order. And they specialized in missions to the hardest places. That's what they took pride in. And so their guys were sent to the, like the Yukon and you know, Upper Canada and Alaska, that kind of area, working with the you know uh, indigenous people there and so on. Well, there was a, a lot of them were Frenchmen, too. And he used to tell the story about an OMI missionary. And he lived in an igloo, you know, and his whole life was just, you know, doing the toughest kind of work. And his superior called him in and said, you know, uh, how you doing? He said, um, if I have enough blubber for the winter and the Blessed Sacrament, I'm fine. <laughs> there you go. That's all I need. <laughs> just put that on bumper sticker. Right. Yeah. So enough blubber and the Blessed Sacrament, I'm good to go. That's awesome. You know, so that's, now that's a pretty high level of spirituality. That's, that's heroic who's, spirituality. Who, yeah, who's yeah, reached sure. a kind of high level of attainment. But, you know, so it goes. That's what we're striving for. Absolutely. I think that's something we can all take courage and take heart in. You know, our, our talk, it, it's typical of uh, when religious people start talking, can sound very, you know, kind of gassy and high and abstract and everything. But go back to the little flower. What does all this come down to? Because, you know, faith and hope will fade away, Paul says, but, but one will remain, which is love, because love is the very life of heaven. In heaven, I won't have faith. I'll have vision. In heaven, I won't have hope, because it'll be... Uh, realized, right? But I will in heaven always have love. That's what heaven is. So do you want a taste of it now? Do you want to get on the path home? Love. Right now. Whatever you're doing. So anyone listening to me right now, what's the path of love? Which means willing the good of the other. Do that. And you'll be going to heaven. I, I don't mean that in some kind of automatic way. I just mean you're on the path. Right. The simplest act of love. Write a note to someone who's lonely. Uh, call someone that you're estranged from. Um, help a kid with his homework. Um, cut the grass for an older man that needs help. Love in the simplest way, and you've realized the whole purpose of your life, and you've, and you've put yourself on the path to heaven, and you're living in Christ, right? All of those things, it's code for that. Will the good of the other. There's your lesson for Lent. There it is.
Well, now it's time for our listener question. Remember, if you have a question for Bishop Barron, go to askbishopbarron.com and record your question from any device, and perhaps you'll be featured for one of our upcoming episodes. Today's question comes from Annabelle. Annabelle has had more of an intellectual conversion, it sounds like, and she now wonders how to develop a more impacting emotional connection with God. Let's listen to Annabelle. My name is Annabelle. I'm from Virginia, and I'm a former atheist. In the last six months, and a large part thanks to your ministry, I've become convinced that if there is indeed a God, Catholicism is the truth. The biggest thing holding me back is the lack of an emotional connection I feel with God. I feel silence on the other end of my prayers and haven't felt any big changes or greater sense of peace since beginning this journey. Am I doing something wrong? Do you have any suggestions for how I may foster an emotional connection with God? Yeah, thank you for that. It's a good question. It's a searching question, and it's got a lot of different dimensions to it. Let me just try to get at it from a couple different perspectives. You know, my first instinct actually is not to worry about it. In other words, it's, it's not a matter, finally, of stirring up a lot of emotions about God. It sounds clear to me that God has already reached into your life. God is already drawing you. Now, stay on that path. So you've been in, involving yourself in prayer. That's A number one. That's extremely important. Do it. Do it, even when you don't feel anything from it. A lot of the saints never felt anything in their prayer. Uh, They talk about dryness a lot. Well, what's the best advice? Keep doing it anyway. (laughs) Don't worry about the feeling so much. What matters is union with God. What does that look like? I'd say it looks like prayer and it looks like love, right? What I would recommend, Annabelle, is pray as you're doing and love, So find some path concretely in your life where you engage in the works of love. You will the good of the other. And then let the emotions kind of take care of themselves. See, one bit of advice was given to me a long time ago is don't worry about happiness. A lot of people, they obsess over happiness. I don't feel happy. Don't worry about that. Happiness is not a feeling. Even Aristotle said it's an activity of the the soul. You know, Uh, happiness is, is something that we we do in a way rather than something we feel. Love, love, pray, pray, and let the feelings kind of take care of themselves. My guess is that they will come in time. But even there, what would all our great spiritual masters say? Don't fuss with them. So the feelings come. Great. Hey, I am feeling more connected to God. They're probably going to pass. They won't last. Don't cling to them. Don't, Don't fuss about them so much. Stay on the path of prayer, stay on the path of love, and you'll be, you'll be good. Well, thank you again, Annabelle, for the question. And thank you so much also for your witness for the work of Bishop Barron's ministry. And thank the rest of you for uh, tuning into the Word on Fire show. Be sure to check out our website at www.wordonfireshow.com for links to related materials. And if you haven't already, sign up for Bishop Barron's Lenten Gospel Reflections at lentenreflections.com. And every day you'll receive an email reflection on the Gospel readings, as well as a digital prayer card designed by Word on Fire's world-renowned graphics team. It's sure to be an encouragement as you head towards Easter. So God bless you all, and we'll see you back here next week on the Word on Fire show.